What a story. I mean, God. I'm confused myself. Ugh. What's up guys? Welcome back to my channel. I'm Nurse Dre. Thank you for watching. Today we are going to start off a new series on my channel called Mystery Monday. Today we're talking about the mysterious story of little Bobby Dunbar, a little boy who went missing in 1912 around Swayze Lake, Louisiana. The Dunbar family was a very happy family. They, um, the parents of little Bobby Dunbar and Alonzo Dunbar, his brother, so there was just two of them, little boys, um, they were very much in love. They were in love with their children. It was a very happy family. So, on August 23rd, 1912, the family sets out to stay with some family in a little cabin on Swayze Lake in Louisiana. They're preparing for a fish fry, and the uncle of little Bobby decides to take all of the kids fishing to prepare for the fish fry. They go fishing, they have a really good time. On the way back, the uncle proceeds to put Alonzo, Bobby's brother, on his shoulders and tells Bobby, you better get out of the way before I run you over. And little Bobby says, you can't run me over, you ain't no bigger than me. And hauntingly, those would be the very last words that anyone would ever hear from Bobby Dunbar ever again. Now, they get back to the cabin and nothing is wrong, everything is fine, but little Bobby's mom realizes, hey, where's Bobby? Bobby is missing, they have no idea. So Bobby's mom and Bobby's uncle start yelling out for Bobby, thinking maybe if we yell out for him, he'll come back. So they're yelling, they're yelling, and at one point, Bobby's mom just faints. Now. This is so dramatic. Like, y'all know when you um, look at movies or TV shows or even books that were set back in the early 1900s or late 1800s, and it's like, the women are always fainting. What is that? I, like, we don't faint today. Like, what, were they malnourished? I don't know. Anyway, she fainted, blah, blah, blah. So, over the next couple of days, they, um, get together with some townspeople. They look for Bobby everywhere. I mean, they are serious about finding this little boy dead or alive. They're throwing dynamite into the lake, trying to, I guess, see if they can see the bottom of the lake, hoping Bobby might pop out. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know. They even tie like big ass hooks on these long ropes and attach them to boats and scrape them along the bottom of the lake to hopefully maybe like catch him, I guess. Um, they send divers in into the lake, you know, going into the little coves, seeing if maybe there's a body there, got stuck in the grass or something. All they turn up with in the lake is the carcass of a dead deer. That's all they find. So theories start coming about. They start thinking that maybe he didn't fall in the lake. Maybe someone, you know, was in a boat in a cove waiting and took Bobby and put him back in the boat and, you know, exited that way. Um, and maybe there were train tracks nearby. Maybe somebody was hanging around the train tracks and kidnapped Bobby that way and got on the train and disappeared. They weren't sure, they had no idea. The town was devastated by this. So all of the townspeople, I'm talking like 500 people, came down and searched the entire lake, the woods around it. They searched for days and nothing came of it. They never found anything. Bobby even had on a little straw hat and they even put a straw hat in the river to see how long it would float which turned out to be a few hours. So they thought if he had gone in the lake or the river at all, that at least they would have found his hat and nothing was found, not a shoe, nothing. At one point they did find some little footprints that maybe, you know, belonged to him and, you know, thought maybe he had gone off in that direction, but it was of course a dead end, it led nowhere and they couldn't find anything. 
Now, after a few days, Bobby's family indeed had to return to their hometown of Opelousas, Louisiana, but Bobby's uncle and a couple of men that were at the fish fry decided to stay behind in the cabin and search for him, just continue to search. And when they found those footprints, it was actually leading off to the train tracks. And that was one of the theories that maybe somebody had taken him at the train tracks. So when they searched the train tracks, they did indeed find a couple of people who were hanging out around the train tracks, a couple of men. Now, police did end up questioning these men. At first they were suspects, but they turned out nothing was going to come of it. They, they had not even known that the boy was missing and police believed them and finally dismissed them as suspects. Now on August 26, 1912, police ended up notifying the authorities in New Orleans, which was about 130 miles away from their hometown in Opelousas. Bobby's dad ended up going up to New Orleans and passed out about 100 flyers that had Bobby's picture on it and had a description of him. and. The description read as follows, quote, age four years and four months, full size for age, stout but not fat, large, round blue eyes, light hair and very fair skin with rosy cheeks. Left foot had been burned when a baby and shows a scar on the big toe, which is somewhat smaller than the big, than the big toe on the right foot. Wore blue rompers and a straw hat without shoes, end quote. Now, the townspeople of Opelousas were so shook by this whole missing boys case that they actually raised about $1,000 between all of them to give as a reward to anyone who would lead to the return of a live baby boy, Bobby Dunbar. And around our time, $1,000 would be like about $20,000, $22,000. So this was a good, significant amount of money. So if anybody had information, surely they would come forward. Well, eight months went by and nothing happened. So they ended up returning the money that everyone had donated back to the townspeople, but not a moment too soon because a week later, a huge break in the case would come forward. Now, in April 1913, the ladies of Hub in Hub, Mississippi, would send a wire through to, the, through to the Dunbar family, letting them know that a strange man was walking around town with a little boy who closely resembled little Bobby Dunbar. He was very dirty, he was wearing blue rompers, and the man that had him was spanking him with a belt in broad daylight in front of the entire town. Well. This was enough for the ladies to have a citizen's arrest made of the man and they held him until police got there. Now, I know what you're thinking, spanking with a belt, we all have been spanked with a belt at some point in our lives, but apparently this wasn't just any spanking. He was abusing this little boy and the little boy was terrified and that's why they arrested him. Authorities took in a man named William Cantell Walters and they questioned him. Now, Mr. Walters claimed that this was not Bobby Dunbar. This was his little boy. And when authorities continued to question him, he changed his story several times. But he landed on a story saying that this was indeed his brother's little boy and his brother's girlfriend, who was the mother of the little boy, whose name was Julie Anderson, had given him permission several days prior to take the little boy on a trip with him. Well, he said that this is not Bobby Dunbar. His name was Bruce Anderson. Now, when the Dunbars got word of this, they sent him pictures to the Mississippi police station and police authorities were certain that this was Bobby Dunbar and they sent pictures of the little boy back to them. They were sure that was him and they, and they traveled all the way to Mississippi to further confirm that this was their little boy. Now, here's the thing. When they got to Mississippi and they got to the police station, 
they met up with the little boy. The little boy did not seem to recognize Mr. or Mrs. Dunbar at all. He didn't know their names. He did not call them by mom and dad. And even when Mrs. Dunbar went to hug little Bobby, he pulled away from her like he didn't even know who she was. He was in fact scared of her. So, unsure that this was their little boy, they told authorities that they're not, they were not sure that this was their little boy and they needed further evidence. So, on the second day, Mrs. Dunbar was able to give the little boy a bath. During the bath, she noted that there was in fact a scar on the little boy's big toe and there was a mole on his neck where little Bobby Dunbar had had a mole too. And remember, the description of him had said he had been burned as a baby on his big toe and that same scar was there. So when Mrs. Dunbar saw this during the bath time, she ended up yelling, Oh Lord, this is my boy, before she fainted. Here we go with the fainting again. I know, I know. <laughs> Let's not even talk about it. Let's just continue on with the story, okay? So, they had to confirm with the other lady, Miss Julie Anderson, that this was indeed not her son before they let little Bobby Dunbar go home with the Dunbars. So, they brought Miss Julie Anderson down to the police station, and her story was that, yes, a couple of weeks ago, she had let her brother-in-law take her little son, Bruce Anderson, who happened to look just like this little boy as well, um, on a trip with him, but she stated that she only wanted him to be gone for a couple of days, but it had been a couple of weeks and she never notified authorities that little Bruce was missing, that he had gone off on this trip with his uncle and never returned. She just, I guess, it slipped her mind. I don't know. But that was her story. And when she got to the police station, she knew for sure this was going to be little Bruce because he was with her brother-in-law. So she knew for a fact it was going to be him. But when she saw the little boy, he did not answer to Bruce. He did not recognize this woman. He did not call her mother. He did not know her name. And when she tried to hug him, he shied away. Now, Julie Anderson said that she could not confirm or deny that that was her little boy. However, as time went on, she knew for sure that that was her little boy. Now, because Mrs. Dunbar had actually identified the little boy as Bobby Dunbar and because he had the scar and the mole that little Bobby had before, police allowed the little boy to go home with the Dunbars to Louisiana. This infuriated Mrs. Anderson and there became this whole deal about whose little boy this was and why he couldn't say who he was, what his real name was, and who his parents were and what he was doing with this man. So police arrested William Cantel Walters, the man who had originally had the little boy when they found him, and they convicted him of kidnapping. In the state of Mississippi in 1913, Kidnapping was a capital offense. He could go to jail for life or, or he could even be punished by the capital punishment of death for kidnapping a little boy. So, in a desperate plea, he wrote the Dunbar family and he said, quote, I know by now you have decided. You are wrong. It is very likely I will lose my life on account of that. And if I do, the great God will hold you accountable. He was desperate, desperate not to go to jail. But at the same time, Julie Anderson had said, yeah, she let him go, but he never brought the boy back. So regardless of if he had little Bruce Anderson or Bobby Dunbar, whichever boy or even some other boy that he had, Regardless, he had kidnapped somebody and they had the proof. So he was going to jail regardless. So finally, he had his day in court 
And yes, they indeed sentenced him to life in prison. Miss Julie Anderson had to go down to Louisiana for a whole court case to try to get little Bruce back because the little boy, whoever it was, had gone home with the Dunbars. A judge had actually ruled that yes, he was Bobby Dunbar and he could live with the Dunbars. Well, when he got home, he the town was absolutely beside themselves. Like they had a whole parade, they put him on top of a, a fire engine that was like decked in flowers and he was paraded through town, flowers thrown at him, everybody was excited. And in, when he got home, the Dunbars were so happy to have their little boy back that they gave him a brand new bike and a brand new pony. Now, <laughs> okay, side note. Here's where it gets kind of fishy. If you're a four-year-old little boy and you're living with a woman who doesn't make a lot of money, she's a single mom, right? She, she can't really take good care of you. She has this whole past that I'll tell you about in just a second. And you have this other family that wants you and wants to love you so bad. You have a brother, a mother, a father who actually has an income who can actually take care of you. You're getting lavish gifts like a pony and a bike. Like, which one would you choose to be? Would you choose to be Bruce Anderson? I wouldn't, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that's a whole other family that is a better life than with Mrs. Anderson, you know? And here's the thing with Miss Julie Anderson, okay? So she, had a horrible character witness when they went to court because she had three children by two different dads and here's another thing about times have changed these times now it wouldn't matter but back in 1912-1913 it was terrible for her character witness and not only that she had a baby who had suspiciously, suspiciously died and she never told this story on what happened with that little boy and nobody ever figured out what happened. She also had given up little Bruce's sister for adoption because she couldn't take care of him and all that was left was little Bruce and she had given him up to this guy, you know, and told him he could go wherever with him and when he never came back, she never said anything. She never cared. I mean, that's not a good character witness when you're going to court to try to get your little boy back. So they go to court, they have their day in court, you know. And like I said, Miss Anderson has a bad character witness. Miss Dunbar and Mr. Dunbar do not. They have always taken care of their children except when little Bobby went missing, you know, that was their only flaw. And Miss Anderson did not have the money to hire an attorney to defend her, but the Dunbars did, and in the end, the jury ruled that yes, this little boy was in fact Bobby Dunbar. So Bobby Dunbar went to live with the Dunbars in Louisiana for the rest of his life. At the age of 18, he met a beautiful woman, they got married, they had some kids, and sadly, in 1966, Bobby Dunbar passed away, but, but, that's not the end of the story, is it ever, <laughs> you know? So, in 1999, Bobby's granddaughter, Margaret Dunbar Cutright, she has heard these stories her whole life that maybe her grandfather Bobby was really Bruce and, you know, nobody would really tell her about it, but she had... Um, come to inherit this scrapbook that the family had kept about Bobby Dunbar and like all the newspaper clippings of what had happened during the case and all that and so she finally figures out the whole story you know she does a lot of digging a lot of investigation and finally she goes to her dad Bobby Dunbar Jr. and asks him to do a DNA test will he do this DNA test and he's like no um, what does it matter? Like, what, what good is it going to do? What is it going to change? You know, it's not going to change anything. And she's like, please. Well, he, he decides no. 
he doesn't want to do it. Now, over the next few months, she continues her investigation. The scrapbook had over 400 articles, and some of the articles were even contradicting themselves. Like, one article said that the Dunbars told the paper that they knew for sure that Bobby was their child. And then there was another paper, another interview, where Mrs. Dunbar said she wasn't sure that Bobby was her son and wasn't sure she was ever going to find him. She even finds a story where the clipping says that both Mr. and Mrs. Dunbar told this reporter that they didn't know that the boy was theirs because the boy's eyes were too small. Now, at the same time, Linda Tarver, who was Julia Anderson's granddaughter, also was wondering whatever happened to her uncle that had died. Uh, they grew up, she said, and they always heard that they had had an uncle who had been kidnapped by these people, and they always said kidnapped. He was always kidnapped, and they never knew what ever happened to him. Finally, the granddaughter of Bobby Dunbar indeed talked her father, Bobby Dunbar Jr., into taking the DNA test. And her uncle, who was, so Bobby had a brother named Alonzo, and his son offered up DNA to test against Bobby Dunbar Jr. So basically they were cousins, and so they put together their DNA, sent it to a lab. Nearly a month later, Miss Cutright, the granddaughter of Bobby Dunbar, got a phone call from the lab. And do you know what the results said? It wasn't a match. Bobby Dunbar did not match Alonzo Dunbar's DNA. The brothers were not, in fact, brothers. And Mrs. Cutright, the grandfather of Bobby Dunbar, knew at that point that he was indeed Bruce Anderson. Now, this information had two different families shook in their boots. They were shook. Bobby Dunbar Jr. even said, quote, My intent was to prove that we were the Dunbars. The result didn't turn out that way. And I have had to do some readjusting on my thinking, but I would do it again. Now, this made Linda Tarver, the granddaughter of Julie Anderson, very happy. She knew for sure that Bobby Dunbar was indeed her uncle that had been missing all of those years and that the Dunbars had in fact kidnapped her uncle from Julia Anderson. But no DNA was ever put up from the Andersons or Julia Tarver. So, was he Bruce Anderson or was he someone else? Now, they did find an article where Bobby Dunbar had said that this is what happened. He remembered being with William Cutright and he remembered being on a wagon with another boy with them. So it was him, another boy his age, and William together on a wagon. And that the little boy had fallen off the wagon, hit his head, and died. And that William had buried him on the road somewhere in Mississippi. Then, when police caught him, he didn't know what the truth was. But he had believed that he was Bobby Dunbar and he went with the Dunbars. So, what do you think happened to Bobby Dunbar? I mean, do you think this boy is Bruce Anderson? Or was he some other boy that this random William guy had kidnapped and maybe it was Bruce Anderson that had fallen off the wagon and died and gotten buried on the road? And maybe Bobby Dunbar was eaten by an alligator I mean, who knows? But it's really suspicious that this little boy had a mole on his neck and a scar on his big toe that matched Bobby Dunbar's description and looked like him, but maybe had smaller eyes. I don't know. That's crazy to me. 
And there's so many theories, like he was eaten by an alligator, somebody grabbed him and took him on the train nearby and just took off, or he was, you know, taken off in a boat. But nobody in this story has ever said, what about the uncle? What about the uncle that took him fishing that day? That took Bobby fishing? Nobody's thought about that. Like he was never questioned by police. He was never looked at by the parents. Nobody ever suspected that he did anything wrong. And I'm like, he was the last person to be seen with this kid. I mean, how many kids did he have to keep up with that day? And if he was telling Bobby to get out of the way, I'm gonna run you over, he obviously saw him and then obviously Bobby went missing before they got back to the fish fry. So what happened? I mean, you don't just lose a kid. You don't just not realize a kid is missing. And then you pop back up and you're like, oh right, he is missing. Where could he be? You don't do that. I think that the uncle had something to do with the disappearance and I think that maybe someone else has something to do with the disappearance. Like maybe he met someone that they were fishing with and that person took Bobby. Like the uncle gave Bobby to somebody and he took him. I mean, there's so many different theories and so many possibilities that it could be. Who knows what really happened to Bobby Dunbar. But we do know that this man isn't Bobby Dunbar and he took advantage of a situation where he could have a better life, I guess. You know, like his mom couldn't take care of his other two children, or his other two siblings, and obviously couldn't take care of him or didn't care to because she didn't care to tell the police he was missing. I mean, <sighs> you know, like it's a whirlwind. <laughs> so you guys, Thank you for watching. If you made it this far, I really appreciate you so much. I am going to try to do this Mystery Monday every Monday, and I'm still going to be bringing you guys some, you know, um, like herbal remedies for those of you that like that part of my channel. And so if you want to see more, please do hit that subscribe button down below, leave me a like, and please leave me a comment about what you think happened to little Bobby Dunbar and little Bruce Anderson. Thanks for watching guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.